Hi, and welcome back to a series I'm doing on complex analysis. Today, we're going to be working with a problem, which is an application of Schwartz's Lemma, which is a tool in graduate level complex analysis. So let's take a look at the problem we have. So we have f of z, some analytic or holomorphic function, and it lies in the upper half plane, or rather it's defined there. Okay, so it's defined in the upper half plane. And suppose that the modulus of f of z is bounded above by 1. So the range is the disk, basically. And we also know that f of i is 0. Now, immediately we don't know what to do with that information, but let's look at what we're trying to solve. We want to find the largest possible value of the modulus of f of 2i. So I said this was going to be an application of Schwartz's lemma. So let's remind ourselves of what Schwartz's lemma is. So suppose that f is a holomorphic function from the unit disk to itself, and I'll use this bold d to signify the unit disk. And also suppose that it fixes 0. Okay. Then immediately we know, we know something about this f. We know that the modulus of f is bounded above by the input, the modulus of the input z for any z in the disk. And we also know something about the modulus of the derivative of f at 0. And we know that derivative exists because it's holomorphic. Okay. And furthermore, we have this other statement that's kind of the second half of Schwartz's lemma, which only really comes up if the problem is really screaming it at you. And so right now the problem isn't necessarily screaming it at us, but uh, we do know that, you know, f kind of takes this disk region, maps it to itself, and if it fixes zero, uh, then we know that the modulus obeys some uh, inequality. And this kind of hints back to what we're trying to do. Right, because our original goal is to find the largest possible value of the modulus of f at some number. So maybe if it obeys Schwartz's lemma, then we can say something about this. But now our biggest issue right now is that f is a function in the upper half plane, not from the disk to itself. So in some way, we're going to have to create a function from the disk to itself, apply Schwartz's lemma, and then kind of backtrack so that we can get something about f. Okay, so let's see what maybe our next step is. So I was kind of hinting at that just a moment ago. But the other thing we want to remember that in complex analysis, we can always make things easier for ourselves by using these conformal or so-called biholomorphic maps. These are maps uh, that are bijective, holomorphic, with a holomorphic inverse. And in particular, uh, there's a very famous one called the Cayley transform, which I've written down the formula for here. And this capital H I'll use to denote the upper half plane. And this D again denotes the disk. And this is our formula for that. Now, hopefully you're familiar with this because it's introduced pretty early on in complex analysis. Um, but this is basically almost what we want. It's a conformal map from the upper half plane to the disk. But if we had a conformal map from the disk to the upper half plane, then we'd have exactly what we want because we'd be able to compose this map with our map f, which is a map from the upper half plane to the disk, like the Cayley transform. And by composing them, we get a map from the disk to itself. So the natural question is, what is the inverse for this? And I'm actually going to leave this to you guys, because that should be just a good exercise to kind of figure out what the inverse is. Um, but I'll just write it in a typical way like that. OK. So now that we have some idea of what we need to do, we need to find this map. And I said find this map by finding a map from D to itself. Well, phi inverse takes D to the upper half plane, like I said, and F takes the upper half plane to the disk. So then the map that we want would just be F of phi inverse, which takes the disk to itself. Okay, but we need to check something else. We need to check whether or not this map fixes zero because that's the second uh, assumption we need to use Schwartz's lemma. So let's see if that's the case. Now, if you look up the formula for the, the inverse of the Cayley transform or you've just done it yourself, then the neat part about this problem is that it just sends zero to i. But we already know and have assumed, as I'll remind you up here, that f of i is just zero. So this works. In fact, this map fixes zero, and we can apply Schwartz's lemma.
let's just take a look at what that says. Well, f uh, of phi inverse of any z in the disk, the modulus of this creature is going to be bounded above by the modulus of the input z. So inherently, we're not quite sure what to do with this, but maybe this can give us some information somehow about 2i. In other words, we want to still use this inequality. And that means that we somehow have to find a way to put this 2i in terms of phi inverse so that we can create this inequality and then subsequently say something about this modulus of f of 2i. Well, I gave you the formula earlier for the Cayley transform. And it turns out that the number you're going to be looking for is just a third. So I won't do that because it's just arithmetic. And now we can apply our inequality. So we know that this is bounded above by the modulus of one third, which is just a third. So already we found a bound for f of 2i, but maybe we can say a little bit more. Um, and also I kind of want to just use the second half of Schwartz's lemma just for an application. So let's pretend, you know, what if this modulus f of modulus f of 2i was equal to one third? Well, let's look back at Schwartz's lemma and see what that tells us. So then uh, if either of these things are true, then there is some non-zero, for, for, for any non-zero z in the disk, then f is a rotation, um, which is a pretty strong thing. So let's take a look at what happens if that's actually true. So if this is true, if f uh, of 2i, the modulus, is exactly one-third, then that means that f of phi inverse of a third, the modulus, is equal to a third. But then the second half of Schwartz's lemma gives us that this composition is a rotation. So in other words, there is some alpha in the boundary of the disk, right? It just has modulus one, it's in the boundary of the disk, same thing, such that This function, which we applied Schwartz's lemma to, is really just this rotation. But that means that f itself, well, we can say something about that, right? Because f of phi inverse of phi, these maps are conformal, we can do that. This is just f, right? But we know something about this map. We know that it's just a rotation. And we know that this map is the Cayley transform so really, f itself is just some rotation applied, whoops, applied to the Cayley transform. So if this additional assumption were true, we can say a little bit more about f, and we know an explicit formula for f, which is pretty powerful.